wasting my time again. Hope you enjoyed today's Sage and Sound advice. We interviewed legendary drummer Simon Phillips. He's from England in the U United Kingdom. And uh, he played on so many hit records, prog rock uh, records, Judas Priest records. Um, and we got to interview him in beautiful Ojai, California, in this very special edition, one-on-one, -on -one, well, two-on-one, -on -one, but that sounds like something, another video that you might see elsewhere on the internet. Uh, with Simon Phillips, a very special Sage and Sound advice, but I gotta get shedding. I'm sorry, guys. Oops. Live for now from the Pro Drum Shop, legendary here in Hollywood. We talked to a legendary pro drummer. He definitely fits the bill of pro drummer from England, Simon Phillips, who gave me my first break back in 1996. He is a legend of all things drums, rock, fusion. He's a lovely chap. And here he is, Simon Phillips. All right, We're Simon in Ojai, California. Yep. Do you remember the very first session you ever did? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and who was that with? The, where, where, where? Well, okay, so there's two parts to this. Mm -hmm. So the first professional recording session I did was with my dad. It was a BBC recording broadcast. All the jazz stuff was on Radio 2, and a lot of the jazz programs were actually recorded at the BBC. So I'd been going to Maida Vale and Aeolian Hall and Paris Cinema, which are BBC recording studios, since I was four, five years old. I was dragged around, sit there, don't say a thing. You know, red light comes on, band plays, I'm sitting behind the drama. So I've been used to the whole concept since I was a kid, you know. And uh, my dad was doing a broadcast that day, and the drummer phoned up and said he, he had a problem. There was some emergency, and he wasn't able to make the, mm -hmm. the broadcast. My dad got on the phone and rang all the session drummers around London. Everybody was working. And he said, right, you're playing the session this afternoon. Because I, I was in the band. How old were you? Uh, I would have been 13. Yeah, wow. And I still have, I have a recording. It just so happened I was cleaning my drum kit. It was all in bits. He said, you better put that all together because we need to take it. I went, oh, shit. Well, I didn't say shit. I didn't know how to say that then. But yeah, I put it all back together and, and uh, he'd already got the music for the session and it was music I didn't know. It was all charts. I could read, but, you know, a limited experience. They were the charts he was supposed to do. And we drove in, I set up and... In those days, we had one Coles. Uh, we didn't used to call them Coles. STC 3048, probably a D25 on the bass drum, probably a Neumann KM84. And that was the drum kit. That's the drum kit. Actually, mics. no, it probably been just two mics. That's right. Upright bass, banjo, piano with one mic, because it was full track, it was mono. And then the brass section was set up tenor, alto, baritone with two mics. They were STCs, and a ribbon mic is figure of eight. Right. So they would just put one mic and the trumpet would be facing the other one way and the tenor would be facing the other way. And my dad had his own uh, mic. Got the pad and I went, and off we went. And after two songs, my dad was on the phone to, to my mom, bring the dance pad, because it was just too much. It was, I'd never played these charts before. I was scuffling through them, but he just said 12 songs in three hours, ain't gonna happen. So my mom brought the, the dance pads which were, so at least he just pulled out songs which I knew. Right. You know, that was my first recording session. Were you sweaty? Were you excited? Were you all those things? I was nervous, but I just got my head down and did it. You right. know, I mean, I didn't know any other, other, other way to do it, you know. 13, what music were you listening to then? What were you into? Oh, I was listening to Blood, Sweat and Tears, Chicago, Jackson's, Isaac Hayes. I mean, everything. I played along to all sorts of Buddy Rich, of course, Count Basie. Dave Brubeck. I mean, I, I used to play along to records. That's how I learned to play. I, I tell people I learned to play music, not to play drums. 
because yeah, I wasn't very technical back then. Actually, my, my, I was pretty limited because there wasn't the opportunity to play in a competitive way. You know, in America, you had mu a lot of music in schools. You had drumline. You had all the cores and stuff. So it's a lot like football. Here. All kids, yeah. and it was very competitive. Yes. I had nobody to. I had one guy. He was a schoolmate, and he was a drummer, and he had very good technique. Actually, my competition was listening to Buddy Rich, or you know, going, how the hell do they do that? You know. But otherwise, it was playing music. It was actually learning how to play a song. So when does it change for you that it became like uh, where you started getting more complex? I guess when I started hearing Billy Cobham and Mahavishnu and then started playing more rock and roll. It was really after my dad's band, really. And then that kind of went to the next thing of doing what I call real recording sessions, which was not like BBC sessions, um, actual multi-track sessions. That started in 73... So I was 16. What were you doing in Jesus Christ Superstar? 16. And that's how that all started. Four years with my dad. Ended up doing all the broadcasts. We did about, I think I did three records with him. And then he passed away very suddenly in 73. I was still going to school. And after he died, I kind of forgot to go to school. I was kind of left with a band. How are we going to continue his band without him? Nobody plays like him. He had a very distinctive sound. Very like Artie Shaw. And he knew Artie, actually, back before the war. So it was a beautiful uh, clarinet sound. It really was. Very unlike Benny Goodman. Benny's was very woody, very classical. My dad's was like a fat wood sound, you know. It was like, like Artie's. Without him, it would have sounded horrible. And I'm a purist. Even then, I said, no, I don't want to do it anymore. Anyway, I want to play rock and roll. I went to, uh, my mom said, you need to get a job. And I went and got a job in a hi-fi store because I was already into right. this stuff. Well, one of the piano players used to play on my dad was working at Superstar. They weren't happy with the drummer. He got me an audition. It's crazy. And, and got, that's really where you no. practiced being a dexterous as well? That came later. Yeah, that's later. That yeah. So, later. so this is old Because you're, you're still leading right Oh, yeah. Point. So I was playing right-handed, traditional grip, you know, kind of a bit of both, you know, like, like Buddy, like all those drummers, right. really, you know, play a little bit like that, a bit like that, you know. And then at Superstar, that's where I was introduced to a whole way of different way of life, life <laughs> right. and living, you know? Yes. And that's when cast members would ask me, hey, I'm doing a demo. Would you come and play on it? Because we didn't have drum machines. We right. didn't have right. sequences. Right. You had to book musicians, take them into a four-track studio and make a demo. And these were studios that had egg, egg cartons on the ceiling, you know? Right. Turned up with my kit, got a little Ludwig kit back, back then, just a four-piece for sessions, you know? And, and that's how it started. Who was and that cast? Dana Gillespie. Right. Oh, right. She's pro probably about the most yep. famous person. And you worked with her for a long time. Uh, Why? Well, yeah, I became. I joined right. a band, did a record, and she took me to New York. Was that the first time to New York? Yeah. That was my first trip anyway. Right. At uh, 17. Going to the uh, bottom line to see Miles. Orleans. Oh. Remember that band? Yeah, of course. Orleans. Freddie King. <laughs> uh, so you were really getting out there and seeing Oh, yeah. We would go unleashed. to the bottom line all the time. Right. And they were main men, right? So that was like probably that, that, that Bowie. Uh, totally. Yeah. I mean, it was amazing. 75? No, uh, 74. So it's full on. Full on. Warhol, New York. Glam. Bowery. Exactly. Michael Kamen was in our band. So that he was our keyboard sense. player. That makes sense. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It was just, he was, you know, playing. Right. And what was the difference when you came to L.A.? I know some of the answers, but these people. Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> session <laughs> scene, which was still pretty vibrant when you moved to L.A. It was on the back end of being you just, busy. Yes. And yes. session scene in, in England. Um, by that time, I was no really no longer a session guy. In England. In England. Right. I'd actually moved into uh, mostly production, and, and I used to engineer my own production, so that's really what I was doing more of. Uh, but I was still playing and doing some pretty nice gigs. Uh, you know, we did The Who in 1989, right. we did The Best in 1990, and all these just weird projects all over the world. I'd, I'd come to New York quite a lot and do recordings and stuff, and, but... Everything was running out for me in England. Um, you know, I had this beautiful big house out in the country, um, but I was I was in a marriage I didn't want to be in anymore. Right. But I was discussing with various people in the States, where do I move to? Do I move to New York? Do I move to LA? And they said, frankly, with your kind of playing and the kind of drum kit you have, you need to go to Los Angeles. He put that drums in a cab, doesn't that Yeah, it doesn't work, yeah. <laughs> Which is, by the way, what I used to do in London oh, in, in 74, 75. I, I sold my car as I was living in London and I used to call a cab 
and I'd have to hide the kit because once they saw it, they just drive off. Right. So I put. I used to have one case, the traps case, and sit on it where all the other cases were down the steps, and the cab would draw up and go. Oh. Open the door, and I'd put the traps case in, but not fully in, so he couldn't close the door. And I said, I'll be right back. Open the door, bass drum, floor tom. <laughs> anyway, oh, oh, mate, what are you doing? Yeah. I said, well, we've got to, you know. And he said, all right. And take a cab to Air Studios yeah. or CBS or Delane Lee or wherever the hell it was, you know, Pi, all these, you know, amazing London studios. And it was funny. So I was doing that, right. what Gad was doing in, in, in New York. Right. Just chucking it all into a cab and, you right. know, before I got a guy to do it. Right. I didn't know there were guys that did that. But Right. And then in L.A., you did start doing sessions again, though, when you got... The move to L.A., it was strange because the whole Toto thing came up. I just recorded Force Majeure, the live album with right. Anthony and Ray and Tony Roberts. We were mixing that. I had a couple of projects to do. And I thought, you know what, I'll wait till about October because that's when the weather in England goes south yeah. anyway. Yeah. And then the phone goes and it's Luke. And that's what happened. That was it. To hear, to come to rehearsal. To come to rehearse, yeah. And then I kind of had a choice. What do I do now? Do I try to get into like session work? Or do I try to remain on a kind of an album per album basis? There was a couple of things. I said, you know what? I've done this. I was a session guy. Right. You know, I did all the jingles and film dates and right. all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I really want to do that anymore. You know, I, I want to, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to, do, you know, have my own sound and do, you know, so, but I did some great sessions, with some great records, actually, you know, and got to work with, well, I knew Clear Mountain anyway from before, but did, got to work with David Foster, you know, obviously Toto did open a lot of doors, because a lot of people, you know, they know everybody, and, you know, they would come into the sessions, and then I'd get asked to do all the stuff, so... Right. So that was great. And you were the only guy playing like you were playing, and you were also, you had branded yourself with the music you'd recorded in England, so yeah, people were yeah. excited that that... People knew what they were what they were getting. Yeah, it was, it was interesting, kind of starting over, you know, after getting to, you know, that level in based in England, and, uh, of course, going through divorce. <laughs> that, that puts a whole different spin on it, too, so Neither I ended up Neither of us a, know of what you, of what you speak. Sage and Sound Advice, we're really excited to have Dave LaVita, guitar player Dave LaVita. You know him from a trillion hit records, can't think of them right now, but we hope you enjoy Dave LaVita. He's something else. He's our pal. Sage and Sound Advice, coming to you right now. Fuck. F this guy is what I'm saying. <laughs> very true what was, what was I was recommended by a friend of mine um, I had been living here for a while my band had broken up he thought oh you can handle this session and he sent me to a session for uh, a Julian Lennon record and the producer slash engineer thankfully Julian Lennon wasn't there but it was at his house and I was already freaked out by like the sight of I don't know George Harrison's you know, second guitar on the wall and John Lennon's guitars, I was freaking out. But anyway, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't prepared mentally for, you know, being asked to do something that somebody else wanted to hear and get it close enough for them to be happy. I basically didn't understand the language in the room at the time, you know, Somebody said, you know, roll through the changes and make them... I don't know exactly what the guy asked of me, but I could not understand him nor do it. And I, my confidence went from 43 to zero in about three minutes. And after about 15 minutes, he looked at me and said, great, we're done, thanks. And I, it was, I was mortified. And it wasn't until probably two years later that um, I met... Uh, two men, one of whom has since passed away tragically, who invited me to be in their band and that kind of changed my life. And that was meeting Kevin Gilbert and Brian McLeod. He's a great drummer and Kevin 
was an all around um, genius musician, writer, everything, engineer, mixer. And um, I went and hung out with them for a few months and that kind of set me back on the path of, okay, you're not a total failure in life. Um, and then the, and then soon after that, recording with them, I learned a lot. And then soon after that, I got recommended for another session. And that was an early five for fighting record. And uh, that went really well, you know? I kind of just did what felt right. They were happy. And that was kind of, I thought to myself at the time, oh, it's like being in a band with a singer where you have to come up with something cool for your own song, but you're doing it for somebody else. And I relaxed about that and just thought about it. And I still had many lessons to learn about recording with people. I got slapped around a lot and I used to get very defensive with producers in this studio, ask them questions like, when they would tell me something that I thought was not correct to play, I would look at them and I'd go, really? Till one day, one producer who shall rename Nameless blew up at me and went, yeah, fucking really. And I was, I, and, and uh, I realized you can't do that. You have to be of service. You have to do what's asked of you and not judge what's being asked of you. And, you know, with any luck, your instincts will be the ones that take over. Um, during the recording process, a combo of your instincts and what is needed and what other people in the room that may not even be musicians might suggest or sing to you because you have to stay so open-minded about the flow of ideas and obviously listening to the other musicians in the room. But as a guitar player, we're often alone with a track, asked to do something or come up with something. So it's not always, which does require listening, but not necessarily to listening to another group of musicians you are listening to a bunch of music, but it's not the reactive, same, quite quite the same reactive process as playing live in a room when you're recording uh, the old fashioned way, you know? Uh, anyway, and I'm still a failure, so there you go, it worked. <laughs> That's great. I was talking to Vic on the way up about when I went to the first Formula One race with you. Oh, In wow. wherever that, Hungary. Hungary, Budapest. And I watched, and we went into the pit. Yep. And I watched them care for those cars, and I realized the, the parallel to how you care for your yeah. drums. Yeah, absolutely. I was always pretty geeky about my instrument. I mean, I remember when I first took apart a drum kit. I didn't even know what was inside a bass drum. They were apart actually. for your first session. You had to put them yeah, back together. That was, yeah, that was one of them. <laughs> I used to you know, take the lugs off, polish them, and, and I always used to do my own modifications. So, like, I had an old Premier kit, and I wanted to put all the new gear on it. So, you know, I'd, I'd unscrew, take the heads off, unscrew the old fitting. Ooh, got to drill, so, you know, figure yeah. out how to drill a hole, put a masking tape so it doesn't crack. And, yeah put the new fitting on yeah. and you know I was always into that I was also always into the setup of the drum kit I used to look at it for hours you know and go mm, I think that symbol should be maybe like that or not uh -huh. like that you know but they were they were inspired by watching other drummers right so like I played along to records but I wouldn't start playing until a if there was a picture of the drummer I'd set up my kit the same way and I'd listen to the record and got the drums to sound like they did on the record. So if I was playing to Big Swing Face, yeah, right. I'm gonna put the right cymbal down here. Yeah, that little tom tom, that thirteen is like this. Snare drums like that. I go right. That looks about right. Turtleneck medallion. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost that bad. Yeah. Almost right. And uh, and I listen to it. I tune the snare up and get the bass drum. You know, and then I'd start playing along to the to the record because I wanted to play exactly like it was. And then I take like a Kinks record, for example, listen to that drum sound, wow. So I'd go into my mom's you know, uh, cleaning cupboard, grab a whole load of dusters, detune the heads, put dusters on. With, I, didn't have, I didn't know what gaffer tape was then, sellotape, 
you know, scotch right. tape or whatever, yeah. and then start playing the song. Because that was the only way I could really start feeling how the song felt. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, one of the, my favorite records to play along to, and one of the most difficult, was Isaac Hayes' Shaft. Uh -huh. I don't know if you ever heard the, the actual double album. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful record. Another record was Billy Paul, me and Mrs. Jones. Uh -huh. Try to play that as a kid, it's the most difficult thing to play slowly as a kid. Right. It's all a. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, really slow, Beautiful. right? Uh -huh. And that's kind of how I learned to get my own sound. It was really just experimenting with drums. I used to buy heads, try to, you know, different heads. I, I mean, I would, I gave up a trip to LA with the guy I was living with who shared an apartment who was a bass player in, in my band. He said, come to LA with, with me. And I said, well, I've got to get a ticket. And I had to buy some new heads because I always did all my sessions. I always felt that I've got to get the best sound I could and I need new heads every time. That's how I was. And I, I spent everything on gear, on, on drums, until you know I was lucky enough to finally get a, 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 an endorsement. The paint cans. The paint cans. Yes. <laughs> I wanted, but I, now I seem to remember that that discussion happened at the session we did with Eddie Creamer at Absolutely, Energy. yes. That's exactly where I stole it from. First of all, I want to, uh, here's a, what do you call it, non-disclosure? Yes. I've stolen everything. Everything from playing to tuning to, you know, tricks. I've just watched everybody, engineers. I've stolen from every engineer. But the paint cans was the session we were doing for yeah. sure. Yeah. And it was the launch of the KSM 44 yeah. the microphone, the double capsule. And Eddie Kramer called me up and he said, what's your kit? And I, we went through the kit and said, okay, what mics do you use? I said, well, I usually use it. He said, oh, great, sure, we'll love that. He says, the only thing I want to do is I want to put paint cans in your bass drums. I immediately said, what color? <laughs> and he said, if I had a dollar for every time, I wouldn't be, you know, I'd heard that. Yeah. I, I said, Eddie, I've had everything in my bass drums. Go ahead, you know. Because again, it's an opportunity to learn from somebody you've never worked with who has made amazing records. You put the phones on, you could tell instantly if the guy knows what he's doing. Because right. you can hear it, you can hear what's going on, you know. Right. You can hear the balance build up, you know. You don't even have to go and listen. But when I went and listened, I went, wow. And that was amazing. What that did, it just, I use this term called microphone friendly. There's certain instruments and certain players make their instruments sound microphone friendly. In other words, you put the mic up there, put the fader up, it just sounds great. Sure. And certain instruments are not microphone friendly. Sure. You know? And that's why a lot of people started using retro drum kits because they're simply, they're much quieter, they're softer shells, they don't produce so much volume. A loud instrument is tough for a microphone to record. You know, so you gotta do a lot of stuff with it sure you know it's like a guitar that's cranked up some guitarists think that it's got to be really loud and you're going in the room like yikes right. i'm not going to mention names but <laughs> oh, of one guitarist it was so loud i could hear it in the control room with all the doors closed you know right. and you put the fader up and the microphone is picking up so much noise from behind it as well as in front it's that pesky george benson it's it's you know <laughs> can't shut up it's you know uh, and I've, I've seen you know people like dave gilmore he uses two little fender champs with a uh, a u47 on each and they're at a moderate level and it sounds huge in the control room you know so um the paint added the density paint, to the, yeah, all they're does, full correct it, they're full and actually i have sand in mine because it's safer but it weighs exactly the same 13 pounds 13 pounds of black paint empty it out get it and clean it all out and put sand in it 13 pounds and you just put it in and it just tightens up that kick and makes it when you put that fader up without any EQ it sounds like a bass drum there's no like not a lot of the all the low end real low end has been tightened up all the top end has been, it's like a acoustic compressor that's what it does it takes a sound like this and does that and with my drums because they're big they're 24s plus I put a front head on it's actually quite a difficult complex sound to record you know put the paint can in and it just makes it work and you did it ever since right every time I ever since you. I stole it <laughs> so John Arusha he cuts two paint cans oh around. that's hilarious oh, it is it's hilarious it really is what made you want to change to be ambidextrous it was inspired by watching Billy Cobham and Lenny White play but the problem was more ergonomics of playing a large drum kit. 
it was awful to play like this because the hi-hat had to be high so the tom had to be high so it didn't look very nice and I was young I was, looks are really important to a 17 year old or 18 and I just thought wouldn't it be great if I could play like this and at 18 you can do that it's a little difficult at 28 or 30 because you you know you've, you're now blended into this way of playing that the brain won't make those that, that adaption so easily yeah. I did it mostly in my apartment on the arm of a sofa that's how I did it and you just hear the sound of literally like, like it's very simple like even right and then right because the, the levels are wrong the weight like, balance yeah. is all yeah. when you start doing right the different dynamics and you've got to try and do it this way you see what I mean it took ages and I just used my ears to try to make the right hand do all those little ghost notes, notes like the left hand. Mostly was done on an arm because I couldn't play in my apartment. And then I'd start turning up the sessions, put the hi-hat lower, had a cymbal there and I'd try to do as many sessions left-handed as I could. Music was pretty simple, it was all disco, you know. The, the tricky bit was, was playing in time, reading the chart and all the other stuff that you have to do. But technically, it wasn't that difficult. Were you yeah. doing those library sessions back in the yeah. day that was so popular? Right. Gave him music. Alan Parker used to do a load of uh, um, uh, composition. And they were so much fun. In the 80s, it became that we, we never read charts because nobody was doing charts. In the States, everybody did charts. It's I couldn't believe when I started doing sessions here. It's like, wow, right. music. You guys all read. It's, right. it's amazing, you know. In England, we kind of forgot that. We stopped doing that in the rock and roll thing. So to do a, a library session, you've got all these... You know, it's like, wow, okay, you know. And it was great. Uh, the first couple were a little rough, but it's like a language. You start getting into it, and then they were, they, they were a lot of fun. I have a whole book on those KPM records. It's so oh, great. really? Yeah, yeah. And those are all super hip to get now. Oh, I bet, those, yeah. yeah. Because it's really well recorded. Yeah. Charts yeah. by the great session yeah. guys. Yeah. We should run if we're going to... Yeah, catch, catch thank them. you so much. Oh, thank pleasure. You. Yeah. yeah. Pleasure. Look, I learned a little something from a guy oh. half my life. <laughs> reminiscing about today's episode of Sage and Sound Advice, and I hope you enjoyed it. We had a really good time interviewing Simon you. Phillips. And having very special moments with David LaFeda. Stay tuned for the next... Well, you don't have to stay tuned. You can go away, make breakfast or dinner, or whatever you, you might do in your free time, and come back for the next episode of Sage and Sound Advice, coming at you real soon. Mm-hmm.